This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I'm detailing cases of deadly love triangles. I hope you enjoyed the first episode, The Case of the Killer Clown. I'll have another scripted episode for you on July 31st, but the case I'll be covering today has been one that I've been fascinated by for a long, long time. I first learned about this case from a 1990 television movie uh, based on this case. It was titled A Killing in a Small Town. And I remember seeing that and thinking this is this is a wild story and I was so surprised when I found out it was true. But recently this case has found its way back into the spotlight with a Hulu original series titled Candy, which debuted last year in May of 2022, um, as well as another series on Max, which used to be called HBO Max, but now it's called just Max, uh, titled Love and Death, which that one was just released in April of this year. Both of these dramatic series are based on this true crime involving the murder of Betty Gore in 1980 in Wiley, Texas. And I'll tell you just a a brief summary, but we'll go into it um, as we get started here. But if you have never heard about this case, I'll just tell you really quickly. Betty Gore was killed in a very violent and gruesome way. She was hacked to death with an axe. Her killer was discovered to be a 30-year-old friend and neighbor of Betty's named Candy Montgomery. It wasn't until after the murder that it was revealed that Candy had been having an affair with Betty's husband, Alan. As you can imagine, this love triangle involving two church-going homemakers in rural Texas that culminated in an axe murder became a media sensation. I recently binge-watched the series Candy, as well as read the book written by John Bloom about the Betty Gore murder titled Evidence of Love. And I had a lot I wanted to say about it because, like I said, I've heard about this case for so long, it's never kind of left my mind in a way. So I've decided to bring my co-producer Loretta in today to help me out. We'll be talking about this case and critiquing the series as well and whatever else that we uh, watched around this case because there's quite a bit. We've got a lot to get to, so we'll dive right in right after a short break. Right, so let's get into this case. First of all, I want to say uh, welcome to Lorena for being here with to meet with me today in the studio and helping me with this this episode. Hey, Lorena, how are you doing? Hey, Esther, I'm doing great. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. It's always a pleasure. However, I will say you forgot to mention why we're doing this, oh. and it's going to become a new thing, especially for our Patreon listeners. Yeah, exactly. This is something we've been playing around with for a little while and we've been wanting to do. So it's kind of like the concept of you guys know, like when you watch something, you know, a true crime thing or you hear about a case or something in the news, you want to talk about it with your friends, right? Your true crime friends, the ones who like talking about these kind of things. And when we talk about this, you know, we don't we don't do it like the way us podcasters do where we go in and okay let's outline the case and let's tell it from beginning to end no we we like to kind of you know talk about it and what are our feelings about it and what are some of the questions we have and maybe just little observations and stuff just like you would be sitting with your friend and of course we kind of get a little bit maybe personal with it like i can't believe that she did this or you know who you know i had a friend who did something whatever right and so that's the part where you guys know this, it's like what we call chisme, right? Where we're going to kind of just start gossiping about the players in the thing or maybe other stories that we know that relate to this. So talk a little bit about that, Lorena. Like, how do, how do you understand this concept of true crimey chisme? Um, well, I think it just started from us anytime we would come up with or when we started thinking about series topics for Once Upon a Crime and, you know, we would completely go off of a topic that we weren't even doing, but it was like, did you hear about this case that just came up? And then we would just have to talk about it. And then it was like, what the heck was she thinking? And with him and with who? And then the other. (laughs) (laughs) So when you think about Cheeseman, it is like the gossip, the hot tea. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, like you're saying, it's not necessarily a serious conversation, but it's more of just shooting the shit with your friends about true crime. (laughs) And And, and I think what we're going to be doing. 
for me too, it's a little bit about just our own personal feelings about it, where we kind of have mm-hmm. a little bit of a more personal opinion. And may- maybe we want to like, I don't know, maybe criticize a little bit or that kind of thing. So we allow ourselves Definitely. in these kinds of mm-hmm. discussions. So that's what we're going to do here. And then we are carrying this forward and we're going to continue the- these discussions on Patreon. Um, where you guys are going to get a little bit more of us and, you know, kind of like how we would be discussing this if we were sitting around, you know, drinking some coffee and just, you know, having having a little chat. Definitely. But because this is Once Upon a Crime, we are also, of course, going to give you all the details. We've done research. We've watched everything. I've gone through this case 10 different ways over the years. So we're going to give you the, definitely the details. You won't feel like you're missing out on anything here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with that. I want to give you guys a background again, if you're not familiar with this case, and I will definitely give you some recommendations at the end of um, what to watch and listen to and read about this case if it intrigues you the way it did us. So, okay, so let's talk about the crime first. On June 13th, 1980, 30-year-old Betty Gore, a middle school teacher and a mother of two, was found dead in her home in Wiley, Texas. Her murder would be one of the most brutal and gruesome anyone in this small town of 3,700 residents had ever heard of. Betty Gore was found hacked to death, and she was found on the floor of the utility room in her home. This was just adjacent to her garage. The murder weapon was found nearby, a three-foot-long axe. An autopsy would conclude that she'd been struck 41 times. Almost 30 of those times were in and around her head. So you can imagine this was a very gruesome scene. At the time of her murder, her husband, Alan, had been away on a business trip, but when he couldn't reach her, he started calling neighbors to check on their home. After about 10 p.m. that Friday night, neighbors finally entered the house, and this is when they found Betty and they found the bloody scene. The Gore's infant daughter, Bethany, was found in her crib in another room of the house. She had cried herself hoarse there for hours and hours while her mother lay dead in the back of the house. The crime scene suggested that a great struggle had occurred in the home. Betty had multiple defense wounds, and there was also a bloody footprint found underneath her body. There was no sign of robbery, and because of the brutality of the attack, detectives quickly theorized that the killing was personal, committed by someone she knew, or some, and maybe possibly, or probably, someone who had uh, some sort of grudge against her. Okay. Hmm. So anything else there about the crime that I didn't mention or that you wanted to mention, Lorena? Um, No, that was a great summary. Um, The only thing I will say as far as, um, yeah, the crime scene itself, what stood out to me about this case, it was like straight out of a horror film. There was two inches of blood found underneath some parts of her body and around the crime scene, just blood all over the place and not just in the utility room but also around the house like little droplets like this blood had gotten even out of the utility room Mm -hmm. and whoever did this crime walked through the home and like blood was dripping off of this person's like fingertips because there was blood all throughout the home too where Mm -hmm. even though it took place in the utility room off of the side of the house near the garage there was blood found in the kitchen in the hallways and then we'll later find out that there was also a ton of blood in the bathroom because whoever committed this crime took a shower Mm -hmm. and tried to get rid of all of the blood that was all over the perpetrator's body had to be and you know so when we think of a bloody crime scene it wasn't just you know some blood splatter here on the walls it was straight out of a horror film blood bath scene i think that's one of the things that stuck with me about this and i'm i'm thinking back to that 1990 movie i saw this when it was on television years and years and years ago and I never forgot that. I want to kind of describe it for you guys this utility room. So basically, it was like a kitchen, and then there was like an open doorway, and then there's this utility room. That's where like the washing machine was, and I think there was like a, an upright freezer, you know, some cabinets where they had some stuff, but it was small. It was a very small contained space. And then right past that, there was a door that went into the garage. So you guys can probably picture that, that kind of a, a setup in the house. But this utility room where this, well, we could tell that this this struggle and this attack took place is very small. It's very confined, tight. Very, very, very tight. tight. And you imagine that somebody coming at you with an axe and you're in this t- tiny confined space and you can't get away. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And they're just, you know, and I, like I said, 41 times she was she was hit with this axe. So, I mean, just 
horrific, right? That's definitely one of the things that stayed with me about this case. We're going to talk a little bit about who did this, what happened, what what did the police suspect, how did, you know, all this come about. So, of course, the usual suspects, Number one, of course, would be her husband, right? My husband did it kind of thing, right? Yeah. So that's the first thing. And of course, he was out of town, but he was the one Mm -hmm. also that had been calling, calling the neighbors. Hey, go check on Betty. Now, we know from other true crime cases and things that we've heard about that sometimes people do that because they want the body to be found, especially when they're out of town. When the police came, they realized the body had been there for a while because the blood was already kind of coagulating Mm -hmm. and things like that. So... He had been trying for like, I think it was something like three or four hours to call neighbors and trying to get somebody there to check on Betty. Finally, they, they went in. It was after like 10 p.m. at night. So they thought, okay, was this a setup that he was trying to put together an alibi? He's out of town, but maybe he had killed her, mm-hmm. went out of town, you know, that kind of thing. So he was the first suspect, yeah. right? While I was watching both the Candy and the Love and Death and even, you know, the Snapped episode as well as the I the people investigate um documentaries in my head I was like if I didn't know already about this case I would already be thinking oh obviously we always think like oh the husband did it but the way it was totally set up like oh he just happens to be calling of course he did it you know oh he's the worried husband gone all day you know if I didn't know any better I'd be like oh no it was him 100 (laughs) percent yeah there was only one glitch in that theory though well one of course he had the alibi but like you said they could work around that because of this fact. The one thing that I remember the investigator saying, the one thing they couldn't get past is, would he leave his own infant child there without getting her help? Mm -hmm. Because what we'll find out is he was calling people and we'll talk about the people he was calling. And one of them at least said, do you want me to go check? Do you want me to go check? And he said, no, you know, that's okay. I'll just keep trying or something like that. If he knew the infant was alone and and her mother was dead, he would definitely have said, I believe, Yes, go yeah. check, you know, to, to make sure that mm-hmm. the baby's taken care of, right? Definitely. But here's the thing. When when Ellen came back, he's informed by the neighbors that he's dead. It mm-hmm. was weird because the first thing that they said was she was shot, which is weird. So I actually did double uh, check that. They did say she was shot, but they said it was a self-inflicted wound because so we know the neighbors got into the home mm-hmm. um, after Ellen asked them, you know, knock down the door if you have to break a window if you need to you just need to get into that home um so when they first found the baby then they saw the blood splatter and made their way into the utility room don't remember if it was lester or richard who walked into the room first but at first glance all he saw was because her face was pretty much oh half that's gone right so he thought she'd shot she herself had in shot the head herself. or something so he's yep yeah, okay. so he said she blew her head off So that's what they first told her. And so he was like, we didn't even own a gun. So I was confused about that at first because I was like, they told him that she was shot, but they told him it was self-inflicted. They said she shot her own head off. Yeah. And then once investigators got got there and saw the blood scene, they're like, this was not a shooting. And that's when um, Alan, you know, returned home. And that's when they told him, I know this is what you think happened, but it's even worse. Like she didn't do this to herself. Um, It was a horrific murder. And that's when he found out that it was with the ax and everything. You know, what's funny about that. that, Now I'm thinking about it. The reason why I thought, why would they think she shot? Because this is, and again, because covering true crime for so long, this is something that is almost like a, an innate knowledge of things that you, you know, one thing I know about uh, people that uh, kill themselves, male versus female if a female shoots herself, it's very, very rare for her to shoot herself in the head, where that's very common for a man. Woman, if she's going to shoot herself, will usually shoot herself in the chest. So I was picturing, mm-hmm. what do you mean? Like, there's so much blood. If she, if she just shot herself in the chest, like, that, that doesn't make any sense. But now that you say that, mm-hmm. that makes more sense to me. So, mm-hmm. okay, I, now I get it. Yeah. That Because that was, that was yeah. what are they talking about? What are, these, these are Texas men. They should know what gunshots look like, <laughs> right? You exactly. Know? You know? Yeah. One thing that I thought was really funny that um, the uh, 
the defense um, attorney said, he was like, this is Texas. People will forgive murder, but they're not going to forgive adultery. (laughs) (laughs) And I was like, that's so true. That is so funny. (laughs) So the thing, though, when Ellen does come home, like you were talking about, this is one of the things the investigators kind of pointed to. They said he had a very cold demeanor, like he wasn't reacting emotionally much at all. Um, Mm -hmm. And so they kind of had a problem with that. And they're like, well. Yeah, we got to look at this guy closer because something's going on here. He doesn't have the demeanor. You know, we always talk about that with true crime. Like when somebody calls 911, if, do they sound panicked enough or not, you know, or, or is this a setup with somebody who's trying to themselves out to not be the perpetrator or something like that? So that was one mm-hmm. of the reasons why they thought, OK, let's look, look at him. I did have questions about that, but when I... I don't know, just the research that I did do on Alan Gore. To me, he just seemed like the type of guy that was just like, okay, like this is what it is now, yeah. you know? And, um, you know, we can get a little bit into the background of Betty and his relationship. Um, but one thing that was going on with their marriage, like she was very type A. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I think he was like type B. Like she was planning their next pregnancy with uh, Bethany to the date like she knew when she wanted to get pregnant she wanted to get pregnant in the fall so they could have the baby in the summer like when she was not working uh, because she was a teacher Uh, yeah when she was ovulating she was like I'm ovulating these two days you cannot go out of work you know she was like planning and he's like okay I think when he he wasn't like sad and his demeanor was off but I think he was just kind of like this is what it is now. Yeah. Like, okay, my wife is dead. And I don't think he was that much of an emotional guy. He just yeah. went with the flow. <laughs> yeah. I will say this about Alan. You know, he was like a, an engineer scientist type. And so he yes. was, like you said, yes. very analytical. And I just think it was for his personality too. He just was. He just mm-hmm. wasn't an emotional guy. And one of the things that we'll see about his wife, Betty, is that she was an emotional person, at least from some accounts. Now, Of course, we're going to talk a little bit at the end here about the different portrayals of her. But what we get more of in the series Candy, it's kind of played up very much more so that she Mm -hmm. almost is very codependent on her husband. Like he has to go out of town um, on business and she hates it. She doesn't like being alone. Mm -hmm. She's scared. She's uh, she feels like she needs him there. So it's almost like a clinging kind of energy that they're portraying on that show. Now, whether or not that's really true to that extent I don't know but uh in the book though it does kind of say that so I guess there was some interviews and stories people at his workplace would say she called constantly she was always calling when are you going to be home when are you going to be home she even called his boss to say don't send him out of town he needs to be home now who (laughs) now that's a little bit much you know what I mean like so there was some of that definitely and so we we, will we'll see this that she was a little bit clingy about him which is weird because he's kind of standoffish in a way emotionally seems like so mm-hmm. kind of a mismatch there as far as that is not not that that's uncommon in relationships there's usually one that's more emotional than the other sometimes so you don't want two really mm-hmm. emotional people because then you <laughs> nothing but fireworks yeah. all the time <laughs> right thank you for listening One other way you can support the show is by becoming a Patreon member. For as little as $2 per month, you can get all new episodes of Once Upon a Crime ad-free and hear them before anyone else. Patrons are OUAC superfans, and we show our appreciation for your support by giving you bonus episodes you can't hear anywhere else, as well as exclusive OUAC merchandise sent to you as a thank you. To find out more and join, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. There's also a link on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Thank you so much. The second suspect was Candy Montgomery. She was the last person to see Betty that day before she was found murdered. And if you want to talk Mm -hmm. about her, I'll let you go ahead and give us a little bit of a a sketch of, of who Candy Montgomery was. Yeah, so Candy Montgomery was born Candy Lynn Wheeler. Um, her real name's Candace, and obviously went by Candy. She was actually born into a military family, and she moved around a lot until she met her husband, Pat Montgomery. They met while Pat was working at a, I want to say it was the engineering 
uh, job that he had, and she was a receptionist. And after just knowing each other for two months, the couple got engaged. Um, they had two children, uh, a daughter named Jenny and a younger son named Ian. So the couple moved to McKinney, Texas, which is near Wiley, Texas, mm-hmm. where the murder happened. And even though it is close by, it's not just like, oh, right down the road. It's a good 15, 18 miles away. So a good 30 minute drive. Obviously, back then, you know, the suburbs were probably less congested than they are now. It's a suburb of Dallas. But when you think about this case, you know, they say she was a neighbor. She wasn't a neighbor. They lived in separate uh, suburb towns. Right. So, yeah, they, they were not neighbors. They were close friends, though. Mm-hmm. Let me just jump in there real quick just so people can get a, get a sense of this. One of the reasons why I think this story became so clear in my mind was, like I said, I'd seen it earlier. But also my sister lives in this area now. You guys know my sister Yolanda. She lives in a smaller town right outside of Plano, too. So all of this area is called Collin County. All of these towns and these little divisions and stuff are in Collin County or right around Collin County. The thing is, is you're talking about how far it is. That is how it is in Texas. Now, you guys, I live in California. I don't know where you guys are from. Maybe you're from other places where there's more land that's available. (laughs) Texas is really big. I mean, not that California isn't, but California um, property is so expensive that we're all on top of each other because we can have small lots. I mean, you go to, to Texas and you go to like the Walmart and the parking lot is the size of a city. You know what I mean? Because because oh there's gosh. so much land. Yeah. I'll be with my sister and she'll be like, I want to take you here to go have this pizza or whatever. Right? It's like, okay, cool. And I go, where is it? She's like, oh, it's just down the road. I swear to God, we will be driving for 20 minutes. I'm like, where is this place? She goes, oh, it's just down the road. They're so used to these longer distances because everything is bigger in Texas and everything's further away. So, yeah. So that it, it. I kind of totally get what you're saying about People talk about, oh, they're neighbors. They, it, in Texas, that is your neighbor, but they live, <laughs> you know, 15, 20, 25 miles away. You know, it's 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 really, it's Got very it. different. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, it's very different. Yeah. Gosh. So you said um, they were okay. they were friends in every everything I've read is they met in church pretty much. Lots of church going people, lots of churches in Texas. You go to any town in Texas, there's 20 different churches for 20 different denominations, you know, whatever and religions and everything else. So they met, happened to meet at the Methodist church in Lucas, which is another small town near there. And that's where they all Uh attended together, the Montgomery's and the Gores. So Betty and Ellen and Pat and Candy and their families all went to this Mm -hmm. church. So this is something that I had to like go back and double check. For the longest time, I thought the Gores were new to town, where really it was the Montgomery's that were new to town. Mm -hmm. They moved to uh, McKinney in 1977. Um, Pat got a new job. They got their dream house in the country. And even though Pat and Candy's relationship seemed to have like this picture perfect life, um, Candy considered her marriage really boring Mm -hmm. and she wanted something more. So she was part of the church. She was friends with everybody. So I think she kind of like moved to this town and just befriended everybody. Mm -hmm. Not that Betty wasn't a part Mm -hmm. of the church community where Candy just like really stepped in and like became a name for herself in a short amount of time. So I had to go back and double check that because I was like, wait, Candy is the one who knows everybody. And it seems like like it would be the other way around and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. But no, the Gores had already lived there. I think they moved there in like 1970. So they were there for, you know, seven years before the Montgomery's were. But yeah, Candy came in. And then just within two years, everything happened. There's a couple of things. And, you know, here's a little cheese me here, because this is just stuff, of course, we're thinking about. But what you have to remember, too, is you're right. I didn't think about that. But you're right. But Candy was much more bubbly and social and talkative and, and active and all that kind of stuff where Betty seemed to be a little bit more reserved, a little bit more like a stay-at-home mom, like she kind of kept close to home. But the thing you have to remember is Betty had a job. Betty was a middle That's school right. teacher. Yeah. She had a job. Candy didn't mm-hmm. have an, a job outside of her home. That was one of the things that was she was bored about. Is she said, well, our husbands go to work, and you know we don't really have anything to do. So she was writing. She was writing poetry and stories and stuff like that. But she didn't really have an mm-hmm. outlet. She didn't have anything. She had her kids. She was, you know, she was the soccer mom. She was all of that stuff. And the other thing you have to remember is that Candy um, and Pat had more money, way more money than than mm-hmm. Betty and Alan did. They had this big old house yeah. out in the country. I think Alan was still kind of working his way up in his, his career where uh, Pat was already kind of up in the upper levels of his career making a good salary. 
And so she had all the things. She had the pool. She had all this kind of stuff, right? So it's mm-hmm. it's a little bit. She had different. the best party house. Yeah, she had the best party house. Of course, we saw that in the, in the series Candy. You guys have to watch that. So, so yeah, so that there was a lot of differences between these two women. I mean, what really stood out to me is just how young these women were. Mm-hmm. You know, Candy was only twenty nine years old mm-hmm. when everything started, right. and she already had two kids. Uh, I want to say Jenny was seven and Ian was yeah. five. Mm-hmm. Gosh, so young, and <laughs> yeah. to have like I. I mean, her husband, Pat, he was making like $70,000 a year. So back in 1977 to today's dollars, that's like $220,000. And, you know, they were making great salary. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, man, I mean, (laughs) could you imagine? Yeah, no, no. And in Texas, (laughs) that's so young. And in Texas, that's a lot. A lot. A lot. So I mean, you're basically a millionaire at that point, you know. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. So that so th- there's definitely, you know, all of these things about these two women. They're very interesting. And, and again, one of the reasons this, this crime is so sensational is because it ends up turning out it's two housewives, you know, that this, this happened to. And also the whole church going thing. Oh, yeah. Should, we should know by now. It's always the church people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> BTK, the, Den- Dennis Rader. Oh, like, God, he yeah, Dennis was Rader. a huge in the church community. Yeah. Uh, Don Wayne Gacy, like, he wanted to be a priest. Like, it's always the church people. <laughs> Why can we please stop being shocked when it ends up being this, oh, church-going folk? I know, right? I'm, I, it's no longer shocking to me. I know. It's just per- <laughs> it's perceptions. So, okay, so the reason why Candy is a suspect at the beginning, they, they don't know anything else. They just know that she's somebody who, you know, knows the family. But they know that Candy had gone to the Gore's house that Friday morning. So she was the last person to see her, like I said. Um, so the kids were at, they were having a, a vacation Bible school, which you guys in, the, you know, the Bible Belt know what this is. It's during the summer. They have a program during the day for kids to go. It's like a little summer camp, just in the morning, usually. And it's based around like Bible stories and stuff like that. But they have activities, they have fun outings and stuff like that. So it's to keep the kids busy during the summer, basically. Well, Candy was um, involved in that. She was helping out. Like you said, she was involved in everything. She was with the kids at the church at the Vacation Bible School. Now, Betty and Ellen's daughter, Alyssa, the five-year-old, right? She was five, I believe. Alyssa was friends with um, Candy Montgomery's daughter and had spent the night with the Montgomery's the night before then went to vacation Bible school with them. Candy's her friend. She's there with the baby. Her husband's going to be gone. It's kind of just to help her out or whatever. And the kids wanted to play together. Anyway, Candy's at the church with the kids. Alyssa wanted to stay another night because it was Friday night and they were going to go to the movies and Alyssa wanted to go. And so she asked Betty, is it okay if she spends another night? And Betty said, well, I guess I'd be okay except for this afternoon she has a swim lesson so Candy, she's, oh, I'll come get her bathing suit, you know, and, and I'll take care of it, right? And I'll take her to a swim lesson. So that's why she went. She left the kids at the Bible school in the morning. Then she went to the Gore's house, probably somewhere around 10 o'clock in the morning. So that's what she went to go pick up the bathing suit. So they knew this. And she told the investigators this, that this, you know, this is what happened. She said that she just stayed a short time there. They chatted for a little bit and then she left. And she said Betty was fine when she last saw her. That was the the last person to have seen Betty. So they have to interview her and find out what she knew. She saw anybody in the neighborhood or did Betty seem upset or, you know, all of those kind of things that they would do in an investigation. So let's move to the investigation. Now, first, we're going to say that some mistakes were made. This is a small town. There were some inexperienced officers who hadn't worked in this kind of crime scene. I don't think anybody had, but crime scene yeah. like this, a homicide scene. Um, some had never worked, you know, murder scene before. The police chief of the town only had been on the job for 13 days. So he was still learning his own job. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I read that in the book. Now, Steve Diffenbaugh, who is the was going to be the lead investigator, he was an experienced investigator. And he was with the Collin County Sheriff's Department. He basically said the way that he would do things is as soon as he heard about, you know, a crime scene, he would grab his camera and he'd start taking pictures from the time he got there to, you know, to the time he left, everything he could. He said, I always knew it helped at trial and it's just good to do. 
But when he got there, there was already neighbors on the scene. Because remember, the neighbors came in, found the body. There was mm-hmm. media was already there. Somehow they got alerted. Small town, probably. You know, they got alerted. They were cheese mean before. <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah. You know, as soon as that baby was dropped off at the neighbor's house. Because yeah. we know that Bethany was taken. You you know she was calling the girls. Oh, like. yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. Did it. Yeah. So it, it, was, it goes. Yes. Well, small towns like wildfire or something like this, right? So totally. they were already on the scene. So he had to shoo everybody out and say, oh, my God, what did they already mess up as far as the crime scene? Um, but they did find a lot of evidence, like you were talking about, the blood evidence. Some of the evidence mm-hmm. found there was a small amount of blood on the front porch. Like you said, it looked like drips. And we know that anything with a knife or anything, a hand-to-hand kind of killing, a person can very easily get, get injured themselves. Again, one of these things we learn from covering true crime is you have a knife or something. It could slippery with blood. Your hand could slip. You could cut yourself, you know, something like that. So anyway, they saw a small amount of blood on the front porch. There were blood streaks on the entryway floor. Um, there was blood on the interior of the front door. Um, and then like you talked about the blood evidence in the bathroom indicated that the killer may have gone in there, tried to clean up in the sink and then gone in the shower and showered before leaving because of course they would have had a lot of blood on them. Right. You know, can't walk out in the middle of a June day in the morning covered in blood. So tried to wash themselves Mm -hmm. off, but they found some hair in the, in the trap of the bathtub, like where the shower was. Um, and they took that as evidence too, right? Uh, if mm-hmm. they took a shower, they could have left behind some evidence that way. Now, remember, this is pre-DNA days. This is 1980. Oh, okay, DNA. Let's swap for DNA. Well, they didn't have that. So we got to use yeah. the old school kind of evidence is what they were looking for. And then mm-hmm. they went to the doorway that led from the living room to the utility room at the back of the house. And like you said, blood covered the walls in the utility room. It was all over the freezer. It was on the door leading to the garage. Like maybe Betty tried to go out through the garage and didn't quite make it. Um, There was a small footprint in blood. And that was right away a a big clue to this investigator because he said for an axe murder, you would right away just suspect it's going to be a man. It's going to be somebody strong, Mm -hmm. a big, big man. And then they saw this small footprint in blood and it looked like it was um, in a a sandal. It's like a flip flop type sandal, like print, but it was a small one. So they're like, okay, it's either a female or it's a, a younger person, like a younger boy, mm-hmm. maybe a teenager, something like that. The, um, yeah, they were able to identify that because of the three dots. So when you, it was like a thong sandal. Some people refer to those types of sandals yeah. like thongs because yeah. it has like the three dots underneath oh, right. it. And that's how they were able to identify that it was that type of chunkla. Yeah, chunkla. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the <type> of sandal. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever use for that. I know, yeah, and flip flop was at Hawaii and then thong. I don't know where that comes from. Yeah. And then you have like sandal because sandal is more of like a slide through right yeah. well, i think it's because it makes that noise it flip flop when you walk right i guess it's kind of that kind of thing <laughs> well i grew up calling it thong sandals because it looks like a thong is that what a little it? triangle <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i don't know why it was called that i never knew why it was called that it was just funny. oh my gosh yeah so when they said it in the uh i think it was the snapped episode i watched they're like no we knew it was a thong sandal because oh, they used like, that oh, word i'm not the only one who calls it okay. yeah they did use that word yeah we used to call it weird <laughs> but yeah kids. because of the three dots on the bottom of it but yeah how funny but anyways the biggest <laughs> the the biggest piece of evidence mm-hmm. though was um again blood everywhere they were able to find a small little thumbprint on the freezer mm-hmm. of like in blood too right and that in was mm-hmm. the one print they weren't able to actually um you know the forensic scientists they didn't have like all their technology and uh fun tools that they do now but they were instead of you know being able to do the little film swap thing they just had a photo of it they took a bunch of photos like you were saying the investigator was so that was was the biggest evidence and i saw saw it and it was a very clear photo very clear um Mm -hmm. and they were able to Mm -hmm. use that so because what they saw in the freezer was like 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 smears of the blood like somebody tried to wipe the blood off and that what they think happened is while they were doing that they put their hand like on the side of the thing maybe to balance themselves and that one thumb was imprinted on on the freezer so if they hadn't tried to wipe it off there might not have been any thumbprint on there right well and wh- why how mm-hmm. they thought they were going to wipe off that amount of blood is beyond me yeah you know? well that's another thing that the investigators said they said that they think whoever did this was trying to clean up and then once they realized like there's no way I, there's no way i can clean this up mm-hmm. then they gave up and right. then they're like, if I can't clean this up, I got to at least clean myself up. And yeah. that's when they went to the shower. Yeah. Yeah. So the axe was also found on the floor. It was partially underneath the freezer. So it kind of had slid, you know, at some point under the freezer. 
Um, there was a bloody pair of sunglasses with one uh, lens missing also found. Um, and there was one sandal also on the floor. I believe that was Betty's. They said it was all of that indicated to them the struggle, you know, the amount of struggle that went on. And also, like I said, the bloody footprint was found under Betty's left thigh, indicating that the body had been moved or she had tried to move the body and her foot was underneath her at some point. Or the footprint was made and then the body was moved and it was on top of it. So it kind of hit it until they moved the body and then they saw the footprint. One of the most gruesome things is, about this case is that the features of, of the face were almost unrecognizable. Like you said, they thought that she got shot herself in the head, but this was all axe blows. Um, they said even the, the right eye was just basically chopped out, you know, um, mm -hmm. which is, is, it's crazy. There was also one, one um, thing that I read in the book where they said there was a gash in the linoleum floor where the body was found. What it looked like to them is that the ax had come down so hard it had embedded itself in the linoleum and they had to wiggle it to get it out to continue hitting the person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is brutal, right? I mean, at that point, yeah. you think like, oh, shit, what am I doing? Run. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, 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 so they said there was some level of, of, of fury or something here, you know, go, going yeah. on. Mm. Well, something even worse than that was what I found. Um, one of, I think it was actually three, two in the head and one in the body, um, that the autopsy, the coroner was able to figure out was that exact same thing. The ax was wedged so hard. Like when you, when you chop something, it's like a clean chop, but when like an ax gets stuck in something, like you said, you have to like kind of wiggle it out. Some of the injuries on the body were from that wiggle. Oh, so not only did, you know it gets stuck in the linoleum it actually got stuck in betty's like her skull face or whatever. twice mm -hmm. in her skull and they had to wiggle it out and i want to say the other one was like in her thigh and the axe had to be wiggled out too that's, that's it's almost like it got stuck and then like not only did it get chopped but then it got like cut don't want to give like yeah. the gruesome details but yeah that um yeah so not that, only did I it mean, happen in the linoleum floor it happened yeah, on her I body mean, you too. can't imagine that the person you know how do you do this right it's just oh gosh it's just crazy no so um, okay i grew up in a small town in northern california where the main you know resource for heat is wood and i grew up chopping wood and i can't even imagine you know i was i did that up until i was like 17 18 when I finally moved out and even then when I was you know older it was so hard like hacking a big axe like yeah. over <laughs> it's it's so hard and 41 times yeah that's yeah that, so hard that's I mean how long would that even take that had to take you know minutes oh, right gosh. had to yeah it had to take minutes and minutes At it least. couldn't have been you just like you know a couple like, minutes cha, cha, cha. No. No. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Jeez, that's crazy <laughs> So, okay, so they start interviewing people to, you know, try to figure this out. And they interviewed Alan. They still thought he wasn't acting right, but he had an alibi. Um, and so they, you know, continued. They kept their, their eye on him for sure. Um, but, you know, they were, they were looking at that. One of the things that they did do was ask him, was there any problems in the marriage? Were you guys fighting? Was there any financial difficulty? And all the things they would ask to see what the motive might be here of if they can come across anything, reason to look at this further. Um, and they, of course, asked about affairs. They said, did you have an affair? And he said, no. But then he said, well, Betty did. Because in, in the book, it says that, you know, and that she did have a brief, brief affair not too long after they were married, I think it was. Something happened. Mm -hmm. um, and there was somebody she, I don't know, maybe saw a couple of times or something. I think it was while she was going to school still for her teaching credential. Yeah, it was with a college, it was with a college student. And yeah. it was like a one- one time thing and yeah. she came and told him told and, him and yeah. yeah and then they worked it out and you know moved, moved along with their marriage um but he said that about her he said no he didn't have any and he didn't have any affairs so that was the end of that questioning um but we'll find out that's not exactly true that's making it to the real cheese man um Yes. So, okay, then they interviewed Candy, and she gave a detailed timeline of the day of the murder. She knew exactly what she was doing, what time she left the church, where she went, that she went here. And you'll see that that's in, in, the, in the series Candy, that she tells this story to everybody exactly the same mm -hmm. way, almost like it's rehearsed, right, of what she did. And she left, and, and then she had to stop, and she was going to go get a Father's Day card but at Target. But then, was there even Targets then? 
Was it even targets in 1980? In, in plain, I know. That's what I had a question. Yeah, I, I have a I question about that. that. I, maybe it was some too. other store, but they use Target because everybody knows Target on the, in the movie. I don't know. I'll, yeah. have, to, I'll have to find maybe. that out. But, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. you know, all of these things she did and that she got there at this time. She must have left at this time and da, 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 everything. What she talked to Betty about and all of that stuff. She said it over and over and over, you know. So anyway, she had this detailed timeline. They took her fingerprints just like they took everybody's who had been in the house because they have to, you know vet everything and, and see who who is it and who it isn't. But they really didn't have any suspicions about Candy. Nobody did, right, at first, except for the crime scene investigator, Diffenbaugh. He was pretty sharp-eyed, and he noticed that she had broken fingernails. And he said, this is a very well-put-together woman. You could tell, like, she has the right outfit for everything, and even when she's just running around with the kids, she's put together. To have a bunch of broken fingernails to me was kind of weird, you know, like, what what's going on there? Mm. Um, mm -hmm. so he took photographs of her. Now there was two separate interviews. That was the first one. It was pretty yeah. cut and dry. And then she went home, but then they called her back. Right. Well, they didn't call her back until, um, so let's go back to a little bit of the timeline. Friday, June 13th was the day of the murder. Um, and then just three days later, um, Betty's funeral was the first funeral they had in Wiley, Texas, because then, then they ended up taking her back to Norwich, Kansas, Kansas, where she was born. She was buried there. Um, that day of the funeral, that's when Alan actually gives like more accurate accounts of like what happened. He talked to her family and that's when he get, came out and told them about the affair. And that's when he was like, I need to be honest with the detectives now. Mm -hmm. And so once Alan gives the detectives the details about the affair with Candy, that's, that's when, when they bring back Candy okay. is, is questioned again. Um, Alan yep. takes a polygraph test and he passes that with flying colors. Right. You know, they okay, ask him, good. were you with Candy Montgomery? Yes. Were you a part of your wife's murder? No. He passes with flying colors. Well, once Candy is brought back the second time, she refuses to take the polygraph test. Mm -hmm. And that's when that like red flags again, she's starting to ask for a lawyer. Um, and that's where it's just goes yeah. down from there but they did photograph her so that was the thing they did yes. photograph her yeah. because and this is when they saw a lot of injuries on her and this is when they're like mm -hmm. okay now now we've got something here because she also had bruises on her body on her arms on her legs and she had a deep cut on her toe a deep deep cut mm -hmm. on her, her toe like an axe gashed it now ellen has already admitted this um and told them about the affair they bring her back in um, she, like you said, is now starting to push back on wanting to cooperate with the police and they photograph all of these injuries on her. So now we're going to find out what really took place between Ellen and Candy and, uh, get more of the chisme on this affair and what led possibly to this murder right after we take a break. Did you know that Once Upon a Crime can also be found on YouTube? You can subscribe to our YouTube channel to listen to our episodes and watch accompanying videos. If you have friends who love true crime but aren't podcast listeners, share our YouTube channel with them. Just look for Once Upon a Crime podcast on YouTube. Make sure to put in Once Upon a Crime podcast. Make sure to hit the subscribe button and like and comment on the videos. And of course, share them with others. It would really help us out. Thank you so much. Okay, now we're going to get into the detail of Alan and uh, Candy's relationship. In 1978, Betty Gore is now pregnant with their daughter, Bethany, the one that was the, the baby in the crib at the crime scene. Now, she's home more, and she's not out as much because she's pregnant. She's not feeling as well. Alan is spending a lot of time at church. He's got all these activities. Plus, he plays volleyball. I don't know, was it a church league or was it a community league? I don't know. They didn't really say. Maybe, that's, I thought a lot of people from the church were there or something. Yeah. So it was uh, volleyball, but they were also very active. All four of them were in the church choir. The choir well. And it wasn't until Betty was um, that she got pregnant, she stepped back from the choir. So Pat, uh, Alan, and Candy were all participants of the choir. Uh, Alan and Candy were on the volleyball team together. Right. So that's yeah. where it started. You know, they were already kind of close. And then one night, this was actually true. Uh, during a volleyball game, Alan accidentally like 
came at Candy from behind and then they just like happened to fall on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And from that moment, she was like, I have to have him. <laughs> so okay, weird. So the, what, you guys, what you guys need to know that, okay, it's a little bit of cheese, you know, of course, but I did, I mean, looking at the pictures of all of these people, I mean, Betty Gore, she was cute. She was, she was a cute girl. Yeah. I thought Betty Gore was, was a cute girl, you know, woman, uh, you know, an attractive woman, you know, Candy Montgomery, she was attractive. And she yeah. was, I would have to say she was more kind of vibrant. Like she just had like an athletic figure. She was very uh, bubbly, you know, so I can see people thought, oh, she's, she's good looking. But even in the, even in the series, they don't make her out to be this beauty. She's got these big old glasses yeah. and this curly fro hair that is like, oh man, that yeah. just is so dorky looking. You know what I mean? <laughs> For, again, they were so young, but in, even in the photos, like when I look at the photos of all of them, um, Pat was only 32 years old. Go Pat. Like maybe making a killing in his career. Yeah. I mean, I'm going to be 32 next year or this next, this month. Oh my gosh. In less than like 20 days. And you know, Pat making $220,000 today's money go Pat. Um, but gosh, he just looks so old to me. Yeah. Like he looked no, like do. a 50 year old man. Yes. Candy looked like she, they both did. Candy and Betty looked like older women like older. I, to me. I don't, yeah, I think it was the clothing, the clothing and the hairstyles and they the wore these style, big, big exactly. glasses, you know, whatever. <laughs> but then you look at the men and they're nothing to look at. I'm sorry. They're just, I know, you know, not. They, they look middle-aged like, you know, already, even though they're not that old, they are kind of dorky looking, you know, they're not like, you know, anything to look at. As a matter of fact, in, in the show, I thought it was funny when uh candy does confide to somebody that she, you know, wants to sleep with Alan um, she's like, oh, Alan Gore? She's like, isn't that kind of a lateral yeah. move? <laughs> like your yeah. husband is yeah. just as, you know, he's kind of like the same as your husband. He's not like any better. He's not some, you yes. know, hot dude or whatever. But yeah, I don't think it was mm -hmm. about that. Um, like we talked about, Candy was just bored in her marriage. She was bored. She felt like her husband wasn't giving her attention anymore. You know, it's like she knew she would get attention from other men because she of her personality and this and that. And, you know, like I said, she had this athletic figure and she was, you know, thin and all this stuff. And and her husband is just kind of taking her for granted. You know, he's working, he's whatever. And, you know, it's his wife. They've been married for a while. It's no big deal at this point. Right. They, um, and so she's wanting somebody have, to pay attention well, to her. I also have. Yeah. I also have a thought, though, that just like I wanted to talk about. So. This was, you know, end of the seven, late 70s, beginning into the 80s. Like, I feel like that's where, like, a shift happened in, you know, the whole stay-at-home mom thing. It was still, you know, really prominent, but it wasn't like the 50s, 60s. Right. You know, it was the end of the 70s into the 80s. Women started to really work. Mm -hmm. And I feel, again, Candy was only 29 years old when right. the affair started. I feel like she not only was bored, but she was also seeing, like... <sighs> I, I didn't see any accounts that she like regretted having kids young or anything, but I think she just like wanted more. Yeah. And for her, that was her more, yeah. you know, she, but that's kind know, of an easy had... way, easy way out because, you know, like, like later on, we'll find out she, you know, going to school and stuff. She could have went back to school. Yeah. She could have got a degree of her exactly. own. She could have, you know, started a business. I think she was trying to start a business, like some kind of home decorating business or something at the time, because yeah. that was one of the things they found in the crime scene was a, a business card she had given to to Betty that had her little her little logo or whatever for her logo business. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. So, you know, she could have done a lot of things, but she decided, you know, I guess it was more exciting and easier to have some man pay attention to her. Now, why pick a married mm -hmm. guy? But that's what she did because that's who she was around, I guess, or whatever. But yeah, so she yeah. decides she wants to do this. But here's the weirdest thing about this. You know, one of the weirdest things about this story is that she comes at it very um, deliberately. Like, it's not like, oh, I'm going to seduce him. And then, you know, I didn't know. She was like, okay, here's the deal. <laughs> I want to have yeah. an affair. I want to have it with you. Uh, what do you think? And he's like, well, uh, yeah. uh, 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 what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, he didn't know where to look or what to say or what was going on. So they start having these meetings. They start having lunches together, right? And and talking about, well, if we did this, da 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 da. And he's still thinking about it. And he tells her at first, no, I don't want to do this. This is not who I am. I love my wife. You know, Betty did it to me. Betty I don't did it want to me. To I know her. how that feels, and I wouldn't want to do that to her. Mm -hmm. And she's like, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, whatever. But you know, what if we did this or what if we did? So really, it was kind of like that. So they finally convinced each other that they could go ahead and do this. 
but Candy decided that she's going to have these ground rules and he was going to agree to them, right? Which were some mm-hmm. things like um, if either one of us decides to end it, it ends. That's it. You know, no ifs, ands, mm-hmm. or buts. If, uh, if either one of us starts having feelings for the other person, we end it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Mm-hmm. You know, it was even to the point where, well, we're going to have to rent a motel room, but we have to share the costs equally. <laughs> you know, like uh, uh, you don't pay for, I don't, we pay our own, you know, half and half or whatever. Just stuff like that, which is yeah. so weird. I've never heard of anything like this, which is, yeah. how did you? <laughs> it was like a business transaction it was, almost. It was. It really was. <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if, if she was like that or if she thought, she had to come at him like that so that he would he would be comfortable enough to to take the leap i don't know but it was just very mm-hmm. odd the thing that i didn't realize because in the series candy they show it a little bit differently like you said it's um you know they talk and he's like i don't know and then the second time he's like okay let's go right but in mm-hmm. the in the love and death series the one on hbo max it's uh, it went on for a while like it did. A yeah. while till she finally was like, hey, it's either shit or get off the pot kind of thing, right? <laughs> like- exactly. Yeah. The first time she did it was one night after choir practice that she was like, I just need to tell you, like, I'm attracted to you. And she didn't ask him then. And he was like, oh, like, thank you. And then it wasn't until I think it was like two weeks later. She was like, so now that you know this, I think we should have an affair. Yeah. And he was like, Ugh. yeah, you know, <laughs> just like <laughs> so not knowing what to do with that information. Yeah. And then more time passes. They meet for lunch um, to kind of like discuss like, all right, like what would happen? What would it look like? And she kind of like gives him this. And then she writes out a full on like pros and cons yeah, list she and she tells him to come over. And so he comes over. She shows him like, OK, pros. It'd be fun. It'd be something new. It'd be exciting. Cons. <laughs> It could destroy our life, yeah. but let's just do it, you yeah. know? <laughs> let's just go for the fun. Yeah. Oh, my God. Exactly. He still didn't commit to it that day. It wasn't until her birthday, it was her 29th birthday, that he actually called her and was like, okay, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And she was just, like, overjoyed with this yeah. information because she was she was getting frustrated. Like you said, it was like, either shit or get off the pot, dude. Like, let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, they even set a date for yeah. them to start the affair, uh-huh. um, which was December 12th, 1978. So only a year after – so, again, the Montgomery's moved to Wiley in – or, excuse me, McKinney in 1977. And then a year later – She's already looking yeah. for yeah. an affair. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> she was. I think there was part of it had to do too at that time in the in the you know mid seventies. It was all kind of like women's lib, and all of that was was coming out. And women now were were staying single and and having careers, and like you said, you know, go, going for for their own dreams and their own kind of things. And she was seeing these women have all this freedom, and she didn't because she got married so young and she exactly. had kids and all this kind of stuff. So I think that was just her way of finding this other part of herself or whatever like that but you know unfortunately she you know picked somebody also who's not available I think she maybe she did that because she didn't want somebody who was going to be like I want to tell your husband and go off with you you know it's it's Mm -hmm. safer that way apparently or whatever but the problem though is like we know love and sex are very much intertwined a lot of times even though people try to pretend like they're not they are because you start to get emotionally Mm -hmm. attached to a person as well as physically attached they start talking to each other a lot having conversations um, you pointed out is that sometimes they didn't have sex. They just, they just talked, you chatted. know, they just chatted yeah. about their lives. So not too long later, it was only a couple months later, Candy says, you know, I have feelings for you. And uh, so mm-hmm. she said, it's, it's getting too deep. And I think we need to end this. And Alan at that time says, no, we can do this. We can do this. You know, of course, now he doesn't want to give this up. And it mm-hmm. uh, convinces her to continue the affair, right? Where that would have been out. Mm-hmm. So it continues on for several more months. To Mind be, you. Yeah. This whole time, Betty is pregnant. Yeah. Like she is going through pregnancy. Yeah. So of course he's like, uh, yeah, let me have my little side piece while yeah. my wife is pregnant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so bad. Yeah. And so he, yeah. he wants to continue it, that. You know, it's starting to get more, more difficult. Mm-hmm. And then he's trying to juggle this and that and work and everything else. You know, it starts to become a grind like anything else, right? So totally. maybe it's just not as exciting anymore. It's not as new, whatever, right? So he says it's it's getting to be too much. We're about to have the baby, whatever's going on. And then so they agree to kind of have a halt to this this affair. Yeah. In June of that year, 1979, uh, 
Betty was eight months pregnant. And that was the biggest thing. He was like, she can go into labor any day now. Mm -hmm. Like I can't be going off on my lunch breaks and doing this. And Candy understood that. So she too agreed to put the affair on hold, not to stop it, Mm -hmm. to hold it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Again, in one of, I think it's, yeah, in the Hulu series, candy uh they made it seem like it was just over like when it was over it was over but it wasn't right july 1979 bethany their second daughter was born and after she was born betty and alan did have like a little short-lived rekindled of intimacy Mm -hmm. you know they were happy and you know overjoyed with their new newborn and everything but then just within a few weeks alan and candy restarted the affair Mm -hmm. um after that, one night, Betty tried to initiate sex with Alan, and he turned her down, and she just completely broke down in tears. Uh, we do know that Betty had bad postpartum with their first start daughter, Alyssa, and she just, to hit, to Alan, he thought it was like postpartum, but no, she was just like, I don't feel sexy. I just had a baby and I'm trying to like come on to my husband and, he's not interested. you know, I feel yeah. like, yeah, yeah, he's not interested. Um he tries to reassure like no I, I am I am but really he was just tired from spending that afternoon with candy like oh, he was all out yeah he <laughs> tapped know? out like he had no more <laughs> he was tapped out he had no more stamina he had no more gas oh, in the God. tank and but from what I researched like he was never not you know attracted to Betty it was just yeah, <laughs> he was just out from yeah. you know being with Candy, um, and then that's when finally he approached Candy with the thought of ending things because now it really was messing with his marriage. Right. Like the affair was affecting it, and that was one of the rules. Like once this starts to affect our lives, like we got to stop it. Yeah, but um, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's here's the screwed up part of this is that she had tried to end it, and he wouldn't let it go. And so they continued. Now he decides, yep. well, you know, we're going to commit to my marriage. Uh, we're going to go to this marriage counseling thing and, you know, make it all work and da, 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 da. And then he tells her it's over now, you know, and she has to just mm-hmm. accept it. Right. Right there. It's like, dude, you were already bad in my eyes. That was even worse because. Like, exactly. Because yes. now it's on yes. your your terms, <laughs> on her terms. It's like, oh, yeah, you're not serious. You still want to see me. But then, you know, when he's done, he's done. You know, so. Yeah. Excuse you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so this is like in the fall yeah, of that's, 1979. That's true. Such a man thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> New men that are watching or listening, like, uh, I don't mean to bash you, <laughs> yeah. but you know, you know who, who your friends are. The bad ones. Right. We're talking about those yeah. guys, not you. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Our listeners are all good. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So the the fall, Betty and and Alan recommit to their marriage. Everything is going great. Basically, now candy's left whatever we don't really know Mm -hmm. what happens during this time i do know from the book that candy did have at least one other affair um during this time uh she had went out and met some guys somewhere where she was just hanging out or whatever and yeah she had been with this one i think it was richard or robert or something like that uh she had been with him a couple a few times so she was still kind of looking for that high i think um and now she Mm -hmm. couldn't get it with ellen but i feel like she did still have feelings for Alan. She tries to make it like, no, it was just over. I moved on. No, I don't know. What do you think? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, so back to like Alan ending it, like he, he wouldn't say it. Like he wouldn't be like, I want to end this. I want to end this because like, I don't think he did. Mm-hmm. But Candy finally was like, you know what? If you're not going to say it, I'm going to say it because she was just like, it's over. Right. Um. So I think the way it ended, like, neither of them did but because like alan just didn't have big enough balls to finally you know put his marriage first candy was like all right if you're not going to do it then i'm going to do it but i think he was kind of keeping her on red too all the time because he was like oh he's busy you know it was like that like he was starting to distance himself Mm -hmm. from her he wasn't seeing her as much all that so she knew she knew but he just knew he was just too much of a wuss to say it you know that he wasn't really in and also like the intimacy was kind of like plateauing. She was like, why, why should I keep doing this? If I could do this I at home, get this at home. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You don't get and all the bells so, and whistles anymore. So forget it. <laughs> exactly. So finally she was like, okay, whatever. Like I'm done too. So yeah. I do think she not necessarily wasn't over him, but I think she like missed the friendship part because that's, you know, in the testimony, he even yeah. comes out and says like, we grew into becoming friends. Mm-hmm. You know, they, again, they wouldn't even have sex sometimes. They would just chat. Yeah. And I think that's kind of what she was bitter about was like losing a friend like that. So, yeah. I mean, everybody can have their own opinion about this, but 
one of the things I know, I don't know if you guys remember in my former, my former life, I was a, a counselor and I did marriage counseling. And one of the things that I think sometimes people didn't understand, the women seem to understand this where the men, you had to kind of explain it to them is when you are emotionally involved with another person outside of your relationship, whether there's sex involved or not, but you get really involved with this person. When you spend time with somebody and you become, like you said, like friends, that's an emotional affair is stronger than a physical oh, affair, yeah. much stronger than physical affair. So when you have both going on I at agree. the same time, that's a tough one, especially for women, because we tend to emotionally attach even more than physically attach, where men, sometimes it's mm -hmm. the opposite. I mean, it's different for everybody. Some men are more totally. emotionally attached. You know, it just depends on your personality and, you know, how you're wired. But, but yeah, an emotional affair is much stronger a lot of times. If you start talking to somebody who's not your person, you know, about deep feelings about things and emotions about things, and you start having those conversations that you're not having with your person, then you, you've already had, an, you're having an affair. You know, and that's what people need totally. to understand. I so agree. this is what happened. So she yeah. didn't want, like you said, even if the sex, she was like, I'm done with that. But she wanted to stay emotionally attached to him. And he was not doing that. You know, he was out. He was like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm done. And it, for him, he could be like, okay, we're just friends. We'll, you know, say hi and bye at church or whatever. But she missed that connection that she was having with this person that wasn't her husband. So that was the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then they decided they had enough to arrest Candy Montgomery based on the evidence found at the crime scene, the fact that Candy was the last one to see Betty alive, and the discovery of the affair that she'd been having with Betty's husband. So that all goes to motive, means, and opportunity, which is, of course, what you look like when you're building your case, right? Candy was mm -hmm. arrested on June 27th, okay, of that year. So it was only a week after? A week? Yeah, a week yeah. after. Uh, two weeks. Yeah, one to two weeks after. Uh yeah, they were days. to build this together. Yeah, <laughs> she was released yeah. from jail on a hundred thousand dollars bond. Like I said, they had some money, so she was able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, that was funded by the church. Oh my! The God, church came really? together and did that. Oh yeah. The um, I wish I had his name. The pastor of the church like came out and was like, "We stand with Candy. Nobody yeah. believed that she could do this." <laughs> yeah. So they, they, she was, she had a lot of support from the community, from her church, and from people in the community, and even her husband. She even had the support from her husband. Oh, yeah. You, you know, because she and had Pat this... found out about the affair. Pat found out about before. the affair. And he, before the um, trial started, before everything started, and he blamed himself. He was like, I have been neglecting my wife. And he actually wanted to work it out. So I don't know. That's kind of like this this middle ground from um, when they ended the affair to when the murder happened. I guess that's kind of why I wasn't convinced mm -hmm. that, you know, she wasn't over him because I think that is kind of when uh Pat found out and so maybe they were kind of working on their marriage yeah uh maybe it wasn't you know going the way Candy wanted to so maybe she was like still missing yeah uh Alan I don't know I don't know we don't, we don't <laughs> really know that that's kind like, of like a blank spot in the middle that we don't know we can you can just speculate and we can you know give our own mm -hmm. theories but but she pled not guilty she denied murdering Betty and uh, she continued, like you said, living life as normal, still attending church, everything's still going on. So we're going to move forward to w when the trial happens. Like you said, Candy was still supported by her husband, Pat, um, and they retained Don Crowder as her attorney. Now, this guy was just a, a civil litigation lawyer. Like he wasn't a, a, a criminal lawyer, but he did a pretty good job for her. He did a couple of things right. Uh, number one is that he hired a psychiatrist to do a psychological assessment of her because I think he was thinking, well... If she did this, because I don't know, what, did she tell him? She didn't tell him at first that she did it. At first, she didn't. So the the reason why the community was behind her, because she only was um, pleading not guilty at the time. It wasn't until the trial started the trial and started. they had to um, finally come out and claim self-defense. I think they were trying to decide, OK, what are we going to do? Are we going to do a... Uh, not guilty by reason of insanity defense because, you know, this is kind of a crazy thing mm -hmm. to do or something else, right? So that's why he said, look, let's, mm -hmm. let's do this, this psych assessment. And we'll talk a little bit about that, you know, um, because it does come into play in the trial. 
Um, so that was the thing, like you said, that was a stunner in court because remember the whole community's behind her. The whole community's like, she didn't do this. You know, they're looking at Alan, like, oh, he's the bad guy. So they get to the day of the trial and, you know, her defense attorney stands up and starts giving his opening statement and says, she killed Betty Gore. And they were like, what the hell? This now is where the, the community gets totally divided because this was crazy. Um, but he claims that it was in self-defense, but this is the claim that Betty had confronted Candy that day when she came over to get the bathing suit about the affair. Mm -hmm. Betty had threatened her with the ax because Betty was enraged about it, right? And that Candy had grabbed the ax to defend herself and accidentally hit Betty. So she got hurt, but she wasn't, you know, dead. Um, but then mm -hmm. as she tried to leave, Betty got up and started trying to hit her with the ax again. And this is when the struggle happened. And mm -hmm. the part that where the psychiatrist comes in is that uh, what the attorney will say when the psychiatrist will testify to is that at this point, Candy like snapped. That's why that show snapped, right? She snapped and went into what they called a dissociative reaction at that moment and killed Betty. So here's the thing. That's the crux of their case because what they're gonna say is she did not intentionally kill Betty. It was not in, no intent, so you can't prove first-degree murder. She didn't go over there to kill her. One of the big things they had going on their side is, is the axe belonged to them. It was there at their house, right? So it's like she didn't mm -hmm. bring a weapon with her, that kind of thing. So that was, I think, one of the things the jury could kind of get their minds around was like, yeah, well, maybe she did threaten her because why, you know, she hit her with an axe. She didn't have a gun. She didn't have a knife. You're going to hear about this and all of the things that happened in this trial is the knowingly and intentionally – killing did not happen mm -hmm. so the psychiatrist testified that candy did not quote knowingly and intentionally kill betty but was reacting out of what he called uncontrollable influences and we'll talk about that in a minute but then also they had the polygraph examiner who again hired by the defense because remember mm -hmm. she wouldn't give it to the prosecutors right she wouldn't do it for mm -hmm. the cops but her attorney hired a private polygrapher to to put her on you know, this test and said that she passed um, and was found to be truthful when they asked her if she intended to kill Betty Gore. And she said mm -hmm. no, and that came out as truthful. So, mm -hmm. but that's splitting hairs, I think, because yeah. maybe you didn't intend to kill her when you went over there, but once you were there well, and you guys had words and you got pissed off, and then obviously... You didn't just intend to hurt her because you freaking hit her 41 times with an ax. That's not exactly. intentional. This is where the people, the community had like a real problem with this case because of that. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where, yeah, you don't hack somebody 41 times, 28 times in the head as self-defense. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I, I really thought about this one because, you know, when somebody gets shot in self-defense, Usually it's like, oh, like I shot him, you know, like I shot him once. I was like self-defending myself. It's not like, bam, 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 yeah, yeah. you know, it's not like, you know, you clear a whole round shooting somebody. Right. She cleared a whole round with this ax. Like right. she just kept going. So, yeah, that's something I really thought about, too, when thinking about that. Like, yeah, you don't do that in self-defense. I saw I saw something I was reading about this case or another one because I'm doing you know this whole this whole thing about the uh, the love triangles love right triangles. and they're like well you know um, you don't kill somebody for a mistake and then somebody said uh, a mistake did you fall into her crotch over and over accidentally <laughs> <laughs> just so, tripped and so, <laughs> oops oopsie you know like that it's an oopsie just like this axe murder is not an oopsie it would be an oopsie if you yeah. like went to defend yourself and you hit her and oh my god I you know almost fatally wounded her or did fatally wound her that's one thing then you call 911 and you say oh my god you know this woman came at me and mm -hmm. I defended myself and I think she's dead or I think she's dying you know but you keep on hitting her and hitting her and hitting her and this is what I don't know how they were able to to pull this off in court because what they said was she didn't intentionally do it she was defending herself but once that happened and she hit her or started hitting her then she was triggered and then it's like something from her past came up that made her kind of snap so almost like she was not even in her like it's almost like you're not there 
you're in another you're in mm-hmm. another state like mentally so you're not another conscious yeah like you're not knowing that you're doing it kind of thing right mm-hmm. so but it's like it's like six of one half dozen of the other they're doing both they're saying it's self-defense mm-hmm. but they're saying it was like almost like insanity but they're not calling it that so it's yeah. just all over the place well, like it, i mean it's a it, great story it, to tell but how does it play out legally in a legal court room is what i wonder you know, how does that work yeah and the biggest thing was also like okay if this was self-defense why did she leave the baby there? Why didn't she call exactly. right away? She went back and did normal life things. She went back to the Bible summer camp. She went taking to care of her daughter that night to yeah, taking care of Betty's own daughter. She if it was self defense, she would have you know any normal sane person would have been and like, here's I something need to call that- the police right now. But here's the thing. Who does Alan call besides the neighbors? He calls Candy. Well, when he's mm-hmm. trying to get a hold of his wife, who's now laying dead in the in the you know in the utility room, and he can't get a hold of her, he's calling Candy to say, "Hey, you know, have you talked to Betty? Um, I can't get a hold of her now. Now she knows what happened. She's the one that did it, and she says, "Oh no, mm-hmm. I mean, I saw her this morning, and then she gives him the whole story of what she did that morning. I saw her this morning, mm-hmm. and da da da, and she was fine. And okay, well, you know, I'm just really worried." Candy says, and and he calls her not just once, but a couple of times at least. Candy mm-hmm. says, "Oh, do you want me to go check on her? Do you? I'll I'll go check on her." And he goes, "No, no, no, that's fine." That was your opening right there to say, mm-hmm. "I'll go check on her because I know the baby's there and I can't leave the baby there." You know what I mean? And so, you know, I mean, you hear about these things. The one I just covered. They made an, an, an anonymous phone call after killing the person because they wanted the person mm-hmm. to find the body. Not because there's a baby in the house, just because they wanted the person to find the body because they're like, oh, shit, you know, like they need the body needs to be found before somebody, you know, their husband or somebody stumbles on it, I guess, or whatever, at least have some shred of remorse. But mm-hmm. knowing there's a baby there left alone in a crib, when you say, well, let, let me go check on her. When he said, no, 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 you could have went and did it and then said, I, I came and checked it, you know, and the baby's crying and, oh, my God, something happened. You know, she could have done that mm-hmm. without needing his permission to do it. You know, this is just worse upon worse, uh, her behavior. Yeah. But, yeah, but this Definitely. is what they said. They said that she basically snapped. And I think that's what they were trying to say, too, is that she was still in this dissociative state when she was cleaning up, when she was going back, she couldn't believe she did it. So it was like an unreal in her mind and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. So they keep that going to try, try to make their case on this, right? That's the way they play it in, in court. She did it, but it was self-defense with this weird ass yeah. explanation of why it was self-defense or, or what, why the 41. They had to find some reason to explain that. And mm-hmm. so that's what they did. And again, they blame it on Betty. They say... Uh, and this whole scene that Betty's coming at her with an axe, they struggle over it. Betty gets hurt with the axe and then Candy gets starts to get away. And then Betty stops her and tries to still get her with the axe. Makes no sense to me. Once you've already yeah, been hit no. with an axe, I don't think you're going to keep going. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I think you're going to be like, oh, shit, this woman's crazy. If that did happen at all, which I have a hard time believing that she picked up an axe if it did happen at all it may have just been to scare her i think yes yeah i do believe like maybe there was an axe nearby Mm -hmm. betty Mm -hmm. and was just like yo did you have an affair with my man yeah like (laughs) you know like (laughs) you know (laughs) that's what the bull you get the horns yeah kind of thing right you're in texas right and the (laughs) <laughs> yeah true <laughs> she didn't have a gun so like that was the only way to intimidate her yeah. and then what candy says is she admitted to it but then she says like oh betty attacked her but i think like maybe candy was like a bully about it and was like yeah i did what are you gonna do about it yeah 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 <laughs> you know? who knows who knows yeah. so i mean so um, but- something happened in that moment for her to be angry or maybe she was already angry maybe she was angry because you know, Ellen wasn't paying attention to her anymore. And Betty was like, you ain't getting my man, you know, or whatever. And then that mm-hmm. it was off to the races mm-hmm. at that point. She's like, this bitch is trying to say that I couldn't get her man. I already got her man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, this, is, this is what this, yeah. is, this is what you can kind of see maybe happening. And so she got pissed because she's like, I'm better than her. You know, it's a whole thing, that whole romantic rivalry thing, right? That we've been talking about all totally. month. And it's like, oh, now I'm going to now I'm going to get you. And maybe she did snap in that moment, but it wasn't self-defense. Mm-hmm. How is that yeah. self-defense? That's crazy. 
nobody believed that she was going to get away with this crime because it's just too crazy to believe that she could get away with hitting somebody 41 times with an axe and get away in self-defense and leaving the infant alone for 13 hours. My God, can you imagine? Poor thing. That baby was you dehydrated. Know. She couldn't even hardly uh, like croak out a cry anymore because her her throat was so hoarse. And she had, you know, pooped in her diaper and it was all over her and all over the, it was just horrible, just horrible, right? But here are some problems though with the, with the trial that I found in, in the research. This was held in Collin County, which, you know, encompasses several uh, towns, but it's not big. Um, the trial was held in McKinney, Texas, in a new courthouse that they had just opened not too long before that. But three people on the jury, because it's a small town, remember, three people on the jury were personal friends of Candy or her attorney. Okay, I did not know yes. that. That is insane. Yeah. Isn't there like a law I know. against that? Like you cannot well, you would, be on a jury if yeah, you, you have think any they, connection? They I think because they only had such a small jury pool. But what they should have done is they should have moved it out of, out of the jurisdiction. I just don't think mm -hmm. they had the money to do it. I think that they just, gotcha. you know, whatever. The jury foreman was... Candy's attorney's daughter's soccer coach, <laughs> the foreman oh of the jury. Gosh. So, you know, they probably hung wow. out together on barbecues, drank beer and shot, you know, shot the shit together. And now he's the foreman on this trial that he's trying to defend, you know, his, this client of his, right? Wow. The judge also seemed to have, I don't want to say bias, but I think made some bad calls at least. The judge agreed with Candy's attorney that the photos of the crime scene of the body specifically would be prejudicial if they sh showed them to the jury during the trial. So oh, he really? only allowed one photo of the body to be entered into evidence and, and viewed by the jury. So they didn't get to see oh, how bad this was. You know, although some people probably had heard about it, but they didn't get to actually see it because the judge didn't allow it, which shouldn't have been. Because, I mean, it was it was a brutal murder mm -hmm. and the jury should have known what they were trying this woman for you know and they didn't mm -hmm. get to do that so the outcome so the trial actually only lasted eight days and it was a jury of nine women three men and after only four and a half hours of deliberation the jury acquitted candy of all the charges all the charges they found her not guilty mm -hmm. yep they believe the testimony stating that candy killed betty to only defend herself yeah which is which and is crazy crazy yeah. you know so Insane. i mean so you can see why this became a tv movie and then later a series and somebody wrote a book about it because they're like what the why we're talking about it now we're talking about it now <laughs> it's just insane so she basically walked back into her life she was still married to her husband pat at this time he was still supporting her while the trial was going on i don't know if it was in trial but while the trial was going on he also found out about the other affairs that she had had as well so mm -hmm. that he was like you know, how much, how much can yeah. I put up with here? You know, which mm -hmm. like you said, which is so odd because you know, she killed somebody with an ax. She admitted it. <laughs> You're not going to leave her for that, but you know, she banged some other dudes. So yeah, I, I can't deal with this shit. <laughs> yeah. That's what you're saying. Murder is like, oh no, but uh, yeah, don't cheat on me. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're not, <laughs> at least not twice. <laughs> yeah. So that was, that yeah. was crazy. So, okay. Yeah. So Candy, you'll see this in the Hulu series and it was in the book as well. At the end of the trial, you know, walking out of the courtroom, she's telling her attorney, okay, well, it's so great. Now I can get back to my normal life. He's like, Candy, <laughs> no. Like, what are you thinking? Yeah. So maybe she was a little cuckoo. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. he goes, it's never going to be a normal life now. She was stunned that the people were calling her a murderer and didn't want anything to do with her and were shunning her kids in school and church and everything else and, and all of this. And right away, she realized she couldn't go back to the church, you know, but... It wasn't immediately, but it was, you know, soon after where uh, Pat did divorce her. They, they got divorced. But Four months after the trial, they moved to Georgia. Okay. And then shortly after they got to Georgia, I want to say it was like only a few months after they were in Georgia, then they finally did get divorced. Mm -hmm. um, but Pat, you know, he continued to be in his kids' lives um, from the accounts that I saw, they did have like a good co-parenting relationship. Mm -hmm. But then as we know, Candy, she went back to school. Um, she got her bachelor's degree mm -hmm. in psychology, I want to say. Mm -hmm. And her and her daughter, Jenny, actually had like a little family practice where they worked with teenagers, helping them with like depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she went back to her yeah. maiden name. You know, she was going to go by Candy Montgomery because that Wheeler. was too well known. Yeah. So now she went back to Wheeler. Yeah, became a counselor. Can you imagine just axe murderer <laughs> counseling your kids? Yeah. Uh, maybe not. 
I mean, she gives advice from experience, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so one of the things that was really difficult was uh, uh, for Betty's family, of course, seeing her murder walk free. You know, that was just devastating, Ooh. devastating, right? But the other thing, too, that they were so upset about Alan, that Alan didn't seem to show any emotion about her murder. It's their opinion that he didn't love her. Like we said, we don't know if he just was an unemotionally expressive person or he was really just like done in this marriage but was staying in it because, you know, we're married or whatever. I don't know. But they believe that he didn't love her, that he basically just, okay, she's dead, moved on. And it kind of looked that way. It kind of looked that way. He did. Because he started dating he was some, like remarried. a woman, you know. He was that remarried was an, in like six months. Yeah. Another woman in the community started coming over and saying, oh, you poor thing. Here you are with, you know, two little girls. And she swooped in and started taking care of him. And they ended up getting engaged and getting married within six months. Mm -hmm. Almost immediately after the trial ended, right? Within a couple of months, right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But Betty's family ended up taking the girls. Um, and mm -hmm. the two daughters were raised in Kansas with her family. And they say the, the girls now are, you know, both went to college, professionals, doing really well, have their families of their own. They're happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still hard for them to figure out, like, how, why did this happen to my mom? You know, like, that that's difficult for them. But they've had the support of their mom's family all this time. This has really been um, kind of like a stabilizing factor for them. I mean, you can imagine the mm -hmm. baby probably doesn't remember her mom at all, which is really sad. Yeah, you know, no. probably not at all. Yeah, they said Ellen didn't just even grieve Betty. He just moved on, and it kind of does seem that way in a way. Um, they mm -hmm. say that Candy Montgomery got away with murder, and uh, th that's why they still give these interviews. Like we saw the People Investigates, the Snapped and stuff. Were they on the Snapped one? I didn't watch that one. Um, yes, her family was on okay. the Snapped one, and yeah, like you said, this is why they continue to uh, give these interviews. They want people to know, like Candy got away with murder. Right. Like even though she was acquitted, she got away with murder right like, it's just it's just odd to me that i mean as a jury i can understand where they're thinking okay maybe it was self-defense i think because of what we saw on some of the shows that we saw especially like on the the candy the miniseries was that betty was probably portrayed and i, I believe in the book they give us more than details about the trial that betty was really portrayed as kind of like a pain in the ass like she was mm -hmm. Uh, annoying she was mean she was cold you get two different stories you get people say she was a great teacher mm -hmm. all their students loved her then you get when oh she was so mean she was so strict they have this whole story about how they took in um foster kids into their home and Ooh, i didn't know if that was real or not yeah that was real they took in foster kids in the home and one of them the little boy they ended up sending away and they said because betty didn't get along with him well i don't know i mean it, it, it's, a, it's a tough thing because these kids are older, you know, and they've gone through a lot mm -hmm. of trauma. Obviously, they're going into foster homes, so they had some trauma, and he was difficult to deal with. And I guess she decided she wasn't able to deal with it and so basically sent it back. Well, in the in the series they show, it's like she's just being very controlling, and he just won't kowtow to her, so, you know, she just ships him off. Now, I mean, it could have seemed that way, but maybe not. I don't. We don't know, but that's the way they portrayed it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but if they did portray it that it, way at trial, you could see the jury was saying, well, yeah, I can see maybe she did go after her with an axe. You know what I mean? She seems like this mm -hmm. really horrid it, woman. It doesn't matter, right. you know, if she was a terrible person or not. She was still a mother. She was still a wife. She was still a church-going woman, mm -hmm. a godly woman. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't exactly. Give her, yeah. It doesn't mean she deserved it. I want to just talk about, you know, just the things we watched. Which one did you like? the most or which one would you recommend people to watch so we had the series candy which came out like i said last year uh -huh. and it can be streamed on hulu still this is the one that mm -hmm. uh jessica beale plays candy montgomery and you do not recognize her really <laughs> unless you look you don't recognize her yeah uh, melanie linsky is betty gore and the only one I, I i know melanie linsky has been on a lot of things the one thing that i remember her from was two and a half men she was Charlie's neighbor. Oh, Remember? yeah. Remember, she was kind of the yeah, quirky. She <laughs> yeah, she's cute. She's she's cute. They have her gain weight for this one, kind of, you know, because she had the baby and stuff, and they make her look a little bigger, a little bit. And then, uh, you know, Ellen Gore. Uh, oh, and this was fun. Justin Timberlake plays the investigator, Steve Diffenbaugh, but he's not credited yeah. in this at all. His oh. name is not in the credits. Hmm. And I found that on IMDb. Interesting. That he, and it, it was huh. not a small part. He was in it for. So, no. you know, but, you know, he comes to like on the third episode or something and you're like, oh, my God, it's Justin Timberlake. Of course, he's in a relationship with yes. Jessica Biel. So Jessica Biel. Yeah. So yeah. he plays. No, plays I personally 
I personally liked the um, I liked the candy one. Mm-hmm. I really did, but I really enjoyed the Love and Death one. I on just Hulu, started or that Max, one. Or, yeah, uh, it's on, on Max. Uh, I on just HBO started that Max. last night. I watched the first one. So this one, um, this one just came out in April of this year, yeah. and Elizabeth Olsen plays Candy, uh, which she's much yes. more attractive Candy than the other Candy, right? <laughs> and then yeah much more but attractive no, looking in this one and then jesse plemons plays ellen which i like jesse plemons but man he looks like a schlub in this one doesn't he he's <laughs> yeah i think he he's kind of cute in some other you know shows i've seen him in other things i've seen him in you know he's kind of i mean he's kind of like the guy next door kind of character right but yeah he's he's bigger he looks bigger he looks more kind of i don't know plain whatever um he yeah. played, he plays alan in this one but i yeah I just, so i just started watching it so what did you like about this one um, I think they followed the actual accounts of what happened more accurately. And also in the Hulu one, I don't know if it's just because they didn't have like the rights or whatever, and maybe Max has more money, but um, I feel like they just dramatized a li- stuff a little bit more. Mm. Um, whereas the Max one was more like they had the actual story and the rights to tell the story mm. the right way. Possible. Um, and as well as, how we're talking about Betty and how she was. I feel like in the Hulu one, they almost made her seem like really timid, really codependent. Yeah. Whereas in the Max one, I mean, she, yeah, she was mean. Yeah. She was, could, was, could be kind of cold and stuff, but like, I feel like she was you know, a boss ass bitch. Like she spoke her mind. Yeah. People didn't want to hear it sometimes, but like, she was very vocal about her own opinions, how we're being right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, gosh, um, I know she was a teacher, but it's like, I feel like she could have went off and like became like an attorney or something because she was very like, again, type A, like get shit done. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is how things are going to be. And, you know, I don't know, like I really liked her in that one more than I liked her in the Hulu one, but yeah. who knows how she actually was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, as well as, in the Max one, they really got into, like, the trial, where in the Hulu one, I feel like they kind of just, like, skimmed through it. And then it was like, oh, she was, you know, acquitted. Whereas in the Max one, they uh, showed a lot of, like, the testimony and yeah. stuff. But both really, really good series. I recommend both of them. Um, I just watched the Snapped episode last night. I loved Snap. That's, like, what I grew up on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that Snap has a little special place in my heart. <laughs> yeah. And we'll, we'll, put, but, we'll, we'll uh, put links to these so you guys will know what, what seasons and, and what episodes if you want to watch them as well. The other one, yes. too, was the documentary that People Magazine investigates. It's called Candy and Betty. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's yes. also you can watch on Max and other streaming services, wherever People Magazine investigates. You can watch that on several streaming services, I believe. Yeah. But one of the things I was going to say about both of the uh, Love and Death on Max and um, Candy on Hulu is that both of them, I believe, are based on the book that came out in, oh. um, gosh, when did, that, when did that book come out? Uh, Evidence of Love, A True Story of Passion and Death in the Suburbs, and that's by John Bloom and Jim Atkinson. I said published in 2016, but that doesn't seem right. I think it was much earlier than that. Maybe that was the reprint. Um, But anyway, that came out, and both of those were based on it. As a matter of fact, the Hulu one, uh, Candy, almost verbatim, even in the order that it goes with the book. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then... um, the television movie, if you can find it, A Killing in a Small Town, was in 1990. Barbara Hershey plays Candy. If you guys know these older actors, Barbara Hershey, she's a great actress. She played Candy. Uh, Lee Garlington, who's another well-known actress back then, uh, plays what they call Peggy. They changed the names on this one. I guess I don't think they had the permission to use the real names on some of them. Uh, Peggy was the Betty character. And Brian Dennehy, which is another really good actor from the past, um, plays Ed, which is Alan. Um, and Hal Holbrook, mm-hmm. which he was, uh, you know, one of these top-notch actors. I mean, they had a lot of good people in this in this TV movie. Hal Holbrook plays a psychiatrist in uh, at the trial or whatever. So those are really good. Gotcha. Um, was there anything else that I watched? I think that was about it. But yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff you can find, and we'll put the links to the ones we talked about in the show notes. Um, and yeah, was there anything else about this case that I think we did a pretty good job of? <laughs> Yeah, I think we covered dishing all the cheese and uh, g- yeah, giving the facts and dishing about it. I think you you guys might want to take a look too about the the psychiatrist testimony. It's it's pretty interesting. I didn't want to get into that because it kind of goes down a little bit of a rabbit hole about Candy's past, which I think it's better off if you read about it or you uh, you know watch it on, on one of these series because it it kind of 
does a little bit of a flashback and you get a better sense of that than we could probably do here. Um, and whether you believe that or not, whether you believe that what she mm -hmm. supposedly told the psychiatrist, um, I don't know if whether under hypnosis or not, uh, was was true or did she use that as an excuse to kind of say why the overkill for the you know the, mm -hmm. the axe killing and stuff so I mean you could it could go either way so I don't really know that I could debate that one because it's hard to know you know I know my own personal no, opinion I, agree. I don't know like I, I don't know I think she's a little bit of an opportunist she may have a little bit of a mental thing going on there but I don't think it's to the extent they try to portray it in trial I don't so mm -hmm. Because she seemed to do pretty I well. She I became agree. a psychologist, exactly. counselor, whatever. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, so crazy. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, True Crime and Cheese Man. We're going to be doing more of these on Patreon. We have done one or two already on, on mm -hmm. Patreon. One. We've so done far. one before. Yeah. So we're definitely going to be doing these. If you guys like that, uh, make sure to join our Patreon if you're not already a patron. It's uh, patreon.com slash once upon a crime. And there'll be a link in the show notes. And we'd love to have you there because we're doing some more stuff. I'm going to try to do more videos, um, do more of these kind of bonus episodes. We're doing a bonus episode every month on the topic um, that we are covering for that month, which is this month is the, um, the Love Triangles series. Love triangles. And uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to the rest of the summer. We got some cool stuff coming out for you guys in August and then moving into the fall. And if you ever have any ideas about topics for us to cover or cases that you want to see us cover or you want anything that you think we should be watching so we can uh, we can, you know, talk shit about, Discuss it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, or just get our take on it. Uh, yeah. Let us know because there's so much out there and I'm always having to kind of wade through. I mean, I know a lot of things that I want to watch and. And watching, but I want to know what you guys are watching too. So give us your opinions. Yes. That'll do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be back next week with another scripted, narrated episode in this series, Love Triangles. Make sure to subscribe or follow so you don't miss an episode. Follow us on social media to keep up to date with all of Once Upon a Crime's news, projects, appearances, and more. Find the links to all our channels on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. If you want more episodes of True Crime and Chisme, ad-free versions of every episode, and other special perks, join us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. There's a link in the show notes, as well as links to all the resources we mentioned on today's show. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. Special thanks to my co-producer and audio engineer, Lorena Garcia, for being my guest on today's show. Until next time, be good to one another.